Very good evening, everybody. We are all welcome to this second session of our Lenten retreat. We can regard ourselves as very blessed to have this opportunity to put our lives before the Lord and to ask Him guidance, healing, blessing. In this second night, we'll have two sections, two talks, if you like. First one with three questions and the second one with another three questions. So it has the structure of a tiny, tiny catechism. And it is probably useful to have the set of questions that we are to deal with today, tonight. For the first talk, we'll have these questions. In very simple terms, what is Christian faith all about? So this means back to basics. Christian faith 101, if you like. Secondly, what, if anything, makes Christ different from other spiritual leaders? What we are trying to get from this reflection is higher and stronger appreciation of our Christian faith in such a way to really be grateful and to be ready to share what we believe with others. In that sense, this is continuation of what we were dealing with last night. Yesterday, we were talking about the inner battle and the outer battle. Because Lent is time for fighting, fighting for the glory of Christ. It is a very particular battle. Well, we need, we need some clarity. We need to have a clear stance in order to move forward. That's the reason for the questions we are to have tonight. What, if anything, makes Christ different from other spiritual leaders? Is it the same? to be Christian or to be agnostic? Is it the same to be a Catholic or to be a non-Catholic Christian? Question number three. Can I truly believe that my religion or faith is the right one and at the same time keep due respect and sincere attention to other systems. Many people are afraid nowadays that if they, are, if they become too convinced about their religion, about their faith, they could also become intolerant. And that's the root of bigotry and the root of religious-based hatred and violence. And regretfully, there's no scarcity of people that are preaching this kind of message that religion is dangerous and being too convinced of something transform you in a hate machine, hatred machine, shooting other people, rejecting them, or despising them, at least. Is it true? Is that imagine fair? So these are the first three questions that we are to have in the first section of tonight. For the second section we have these other three, is there any room for religion in a world dominated by science? 
Second, is it not the case that more religion means more fanaticism and fundamentalism? And finally, is it possible to be a true Christian and at the same time to enjoy this present life? I think that some people are afraid of becoming too Christian because that could transform their souls in such a way that they are bitter against almost everything that is pleasurable, that is amiable about this life, this present life. The whole idea is, the whole idea for tonight is embracing a clear stance regarding our Christian faith. That's the whole idea. So let's address the first three questions. The first one, in very simple terms, what is Christian faith all about? What are we proposing? What's our proposal? And in what sense is it necessary, if it is? We owe so many things to Pope John Paul II, blessed Pope John Paul II, also known as John Paul the Great. One of the things that I really appreciate much from his teaching was the idea that there is a correlation between the understanding of what sin is and the understanding of what God's grace is. In such a way, says the Pope, that when we lose sight of what sin is, we also lose sight of what grace is. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Because a person that honestly, or at least to the best of his or her understanding, doesn't, doesn't admit that has to ask for pardon, mercy, forgiveness, that person simply cannot see any good news in the fact that God is offering his grace, his pardon, his forgiveness. I suppose this is equivalent to somebody that has no hunger at all. No hunger at all. For example, that person could be completely filled. And at that point, the best offering that could be brought to him from the best restaurant in the world wouldn't make any sense, wouldn't we don't awake some form of desire or appetite in that person. When there's no recognition, when there's no awareness of the need, there's no awareness of the answer. We only appreciate a fresh, cold, nice glass of water when we are thirsty. So Christian faith becomes understandable, be makes sense only when we come to recognize the drama, the drama of human existence. People that have come to recognize that drama immediately see the virtue of coming to know Jesus and coming to accept his gospel and coming to be blessed and transformed by His grace and by the gift of the Holy Spirit that He earned for us. And what's that drama? What's the recognition? How can we make visible that drama? I think, and it is not only my thinking, 
that this is a very personal journey. And some people can reach this goal more easily than other people. In the Gospel, we have this very powerful and almost rude affirmation coming from Jesus' mouth. He says that tax collectors and prostitutes are going ahead of us or ahead of many people in accepting the kingdom of God. Why is it so? Is it because they are better people? That's not what the Lord is saying. What he is saying is that they go ahead, ahead from the crowd in accepting, in receiving the kingdom of God. On closer inspection, we see the reason. Tax collectors were, at the time Jesus lived on this earth, tax collectors were public sinners. And of course, prostitutes were also public sinners. When sin becomes something so visible, so impossible to be denied, the undeniable fact that I am a sinner readies myself to recognize that I need to do something about it. It is the recognition of sin that makes that people, tax collectors and prostitutes in this case, able to see what Jesus is bringing to them, bring into their lives. It is a personal journey because the process of acknowledging that we are sinners takes more time for some people, less time for other people. Usually, people whose faults whose sins are that visible as they are in the case of tax collectors and prostitutes. People that cannot deny what they are doing, people that are in so many ways blamed by others, cannot deny what they are, and that becomes the opportunity of acknowledging I should better do something about this. On the other hand, people that have some sins, have committed some sins, but these sins are not that visible, have a very hard time coming to recognize that they really need to do something about their lives. Think, for example, of a person that is really, really good telling lies. It is a very clever person, is so smart, is so able to fabricate whatever story comes to be useful in order to justify his behavior, in order to save the face as they say. It is very intelligent, very smart, and has a very quick mind, and is able to win the hand with no big difficulty. That person, even if he or she is committing sin almost on a daily basis, would regard himself or herself as a very astute and smart people. And probably he could think of himself, how intelligent I am. These poor guys around me don't get anything from me 
because I am so quick and so smart as to get whatever I want from them. So I am the clever one. I am, I really deserve to win this game, the game of life. That person would have real difficulty in recognizing that he is a sinner. A different story, but one that is connected with the same theme, is the case of a person that is bringing easy pleasure to his life. Think of a person that is drug addicted. This person is using drugs, is having very fun, I'm not doing any wrong to anyone. I'm fine, I just want to enjoy myself. Or think, for example, of a couple that is enjoying very strong and very frequent sexual pleasure. Probably they are not even married and they are not thinking of marriage. They are not thinking of starting, of beginning some home. That word, that concept is not in their horizon. They just think of enjoying themselves. I enjoy having this kind of experience with my girlfriend and she enjoys having that kind of experience with myself. We are very glad to have this wonderful bodies that are giving us such an amount of big and powerful pleasure. We are not harming anyone. We are not destroying anyone. Accordingly, nobody should have the right to enter into our relationship. We are just enjoying ourselves. If you want to do something for society, Go grab some criminals, go grab some robbers. That's your task, but stop messing with ourselves. We are very happy, we are very glad. This kind of situation is also a good example of people that with great difficulty are able to see what's wrong with their behavior. They feel that they are okay. And I have a more difficult case for your consideration, dear friend. Think of a person that is not doing anything wrong, nor is she doing anything good. I'm just living for myself. I take care of myself. I don't mess with anybody else. So please don't mess with me. I'm fine, you are fine, no problem. We can recognize that there might be a lot of egotism in that talk, in that way of speaking of human life. We probably have at the back of our minds the idea that human life should have some sort of service, some sort of going out from yourself in order to do something good for others. But if a person is playing by the rules, the rules of society, I'm not hurting anyone, I'm not robbing, I'm not hijacking, I'm not killing anybody, so please don't mess with me, I don't mess with you. And that's it. A person in that situation would have a really, really difficult time trying to understand what's wrong with that position. I am fine, you are fine, so what's the problem? We see that Christian faith becomes meaningless for a person in that situation. 
And if I ask people, say those couples I mentioned before, if I ask those, what do you think of Christian faith? Christian faith. Christian faith, faith is something of the past. It's, it's a hindrance. It's some strange form of backward thinking that would be good to disappear if they like. But if they don't want to disappear, okay, keep your faith for yourselves and leave me alone. That probably would be their answer. It takes a lot of time for people in that situation to recognize that easy pleasure, social indifference, and huge amounts of egotism are not good. It takes a lot of time. Eventually, eventually people come to recognize that. For example, when we speak of these couples, usually it is the woman. It is the woman, the first one to recognize that this kind of entertainment, quote unquote entertainment, is not really feeling of meaning her existence. This is not enough for me. There is an interesting study, interesting investigation about what kind of expectations couples have when they are having casual sex or when they are going to live together with no compromise at all, no commitment. Even if they say that there's no commitment, it is usually the lady, it is usually the woman, the first one to recognize this doesn't make much sense. So, okay, yes, it is good. Let me propose a very simple, almost childish comparison. Okay, this is like eating chocolate. Yes, it's good, um, it makes me feel good, it's okay, but uh, I don't see myself just eating chocolate many, many days in the future till I drop dead. I suppose life is for something else. And that kind of hunger, hunger for meaning, hunger to be fruitful, hunger for being more than consumers of pleasure, that kind of hunger probably, probably will push the person to make some difficult questions. Suppose two or three years in that situation, Okay, we have tried almost everything, everything. Okay, we already know how this works. But what else? What comes next? No, this is our agreement. You know very well that we have agreed to have this kind of life, no commitment. I live with you, you live with me, we enjoy ourselves. Okay, but I am growing tired of just enjoying ourselves. The real reason, if that person might be able to put it in words, the real reason for that is that human heart was designed, was made, was created with very, very profound desires. And one of these desires is to give up yourself, to commit yourself completely for the good of others. And when people are just 
enjoying themselves using drugs or using sex as a drug, they are not really responding to that profound urge. We, as humans, we have that profound urge, the urge of giving up ourselves to enter in real commitment and to spend what we are, to spend what we have. It is not only earning, it is also spending. We need to spend what we have. But it takes a lot of time for some people, for many people. It takes a lot of time coming to recognize that they have, they too have, the urge to spend their lives to do something for others. Usually, that's my experience, and uh, that's also what I have read in some studies about this subject. Usually, it is the woman, the first one, to make some difficult questions. Sweetheart, would you consider that we, that we make a family? Would you like that? No, I'm okay as we are. I'm perfectly okay as we are. And this was our agreement and I enjoy you, you enjoy me, <laughs> and all that discourse. Yes, yes, that was our agreement. But could we have another, a different agreement? What are you thinking about? Well, I am thinking of, say, I don't know, having a family? Wouldn't you be happier if you have, for example, one baby, two babies, to raise our children, to make a family? No, I don't see myself in that. Unless, unless, you get for me very powerful noise-canceling earphones. Because I know those babies, they have a very loud voice and a very high pitch. And I don't like that experience. Well, to make a long story a little shorter, the thing is that a sense of emptiness, a sense of frustration comes to the soul and slowly but surely comes to be deposited, comes to really establish itself at the deepest levels of the soul. And it is, it is something difficult to identify, but it is real. And it becomes something that can drag people towards sadness. Difficult to explain sadness. I should be happy. I am young, I have a good job, I can go to really good restaurants, um, I have my man or my woman, we enjoy ourselves, but something is missing. Something is missing. It takes, again I repeat myself, it takes a lot of time, a lot of time, to really acknowledge, A, is not, is not, uh, this is not working. This is not working. And when that person comes to recognize this is not working, it begins his journey. It begins her journey. And that can be a very long journey. Because it entails to recognize that I was not right. I was not right on the spot. Even if it looks very reasonable, 
even if everybody else is doing it, it's not working for me. That sense of frustration, difficult to identify but very real sadness, that beginning of depression, that somber feeling of, am I losing my life? Is this all that life can bring to me? Is this all that I can bring to my life? That kind of questioning could be very powerful. God's grace is already working in that person. God's grace is guiding secretly, gently, kindly. God's grace is guiding that person to questions more progressively, more and more difficult to answer. What if I have been wrong? Probably I was with the wrong person. Probably what I need is a fresh start, a new relationship. So let's throw away this guy from my life and let's accept another, a different person. It could work for a while, but if you keep the same scheme, same results will follow. No, it is not exactly, it's not exactly the other person. And this is the time when people begin to say, it is not you, it is me. It is me. It is something in me, something is wrong with me. And some people at this stage begin to look for a response, to look for a solution far from the initial quest. For example, some people say, I need something spiritual. Let's practice some meditation. What I need is a bit, it's a bit of spirituality coming to my life. A bit of spirituality. I'll pray, well, pray is not the word that would be used at that time. I'll meditate, some silence, some relax, some exercise, for example, some yoga. That would be a solution. I meditate, I keep some quietness in my hectic schedule, in my hectic agenda. I reserve and I defend some portions of quietness and meditation. I learn how to breathe very slowly, very slowly. I now know how to breathe. I know how to relax. I know how to meditate. And for some people, that would be a sort of solution, at least for some time. But there is something that is not answered with that solution. If you think of it, that meditation and relax and quietness is still a sort of jail. Wow, what a word. Jail. Because again, the person is secluded within himself or herself. The person is like a prisoner of his own thoughts. The person is enclosed in that peace that I rather should call tranquility. But what about that powerful hunger that inhabits human heart, the human heart? That powerful hunger of 
committing myself to make something really good for others. Oh, this is difficult. When you think of all the possibilities and the many, many quests and searches of so many people, you realize it is really a miracle that a person comes to realize I am a sinner, there's hope for me, that hope comes from Jesus, his message makes a lot of sense, his grace is powerful enough to transform me, so I come to him, I accept his message, I, I really, I really will be repented. Only a contrite heart can embrace the fullness of Jesus' message. Coming to that end, coming to that goal, it is really a miracle. And I have no difficulty in admitting that. It is really difficult because there are so many meanders in the road. You could go this way and then you find another religion, another philosophy, another practice, and then you have philanthropy and you have people that are doing some good for others but they think that the good that they have to do for others is, for example, trying to avoid or to lower birth rate. Oh my! So there are people that think that the best service they could bring to the world is just to lower birth rate. And other people think that engaging themselves completely in a political party, a political fight would be a solution for them. Others think that saving nature from destruction and fighting for the ecolog ecological battle is the best choice they have. It is, it is a miracle that a person at some point is reached by the grace of the Lord. And all of a sudden, that person can open his mind and say, yes, yes, that guy, that wonderful man, Jesus Christ makes sense. It is a miracle. That miracle has happened to many, many people. And I hope all of us, or many among us, have had that kind of experience. Jesus makes sense in my life. So our first question was, what is Christian faith all about? Answer, it's about acknowledging the power of sin and acknowledging the even greater power of God's grace manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is the reason we attempt to come nearer, nearer the gospel of the Lord, because we are convinced that the more we listen to this word of life, the more we come to understand that it is a real gift to know him and to accept him and to say a big yes to him. And that encounter is the one that produces faith. Faith, it is not. Faith is not a hypothesis in my mind. Faith is not just the construction of a set of ideas in my mind. For example, coming to recite lots of texts from the Bible or from the Catechism. Faith is far more the fruit of an encounter with this really astonishing 
astonishing gift of God because every, every gift from God the Father is present in the person of Jesus Christ. This is not a course on apologetics, so we are not, not even attempting to explain in what sense Jesus is able to fill all those expectations. We are just trying to bear testimony that some people, some people have come near the Lord and listening to his word and seeing his example and accepting his grace, their lives have become very, very different for the good. And what makes Christ different from other spiritual leaders? This was the second question. Well, we can move a little more rapidly with this second question. What makes Christ different is not exactly his teaching. Teachers, spiritual teachers, people with powerful or very inspired and inspiring discourses, there are a lot of them. What makes Christ different is that we confess that he has died for us. It is his death, the way he delivered himself for the glory of the Father and for our sake, for our salvation. It is his full deliverance, his complete surrendering, not to frustration and failure, but his full deliverance, his complete surrendering to God the Father's plan in order to show the extent of his love. Because there's no greater love than coming to deliver one's life for others. And that's what the Lord has done. So we understand that this is what makes Christ different. This is not said about any other leader. We have beautiful teachings from Buddha. We have, we have some beautiful and inspiring teachings from Muhammad. And we have all respect for every religion and for every believer. But followers of the faith that was preached by Muhammad never said that Muhammad's death was meaningful for them. It is just the teaching, it is the doctrine, what they believe. We, instead, we believe that Jesus' death, Jesus' complete giving up, is what makes our lives different. So that Christian faith is not simple understanding of a set of ideas, a set of doctrine. It is accepting a powerful stream, powerful stream of grace, stream of love that has been manifested in the person of Jesus. It's about accepting, opening up our hearts and accepting, receiving this powerful stream of grace. So what Jesus, I can say it even shorter, what Jesus brings to our life is not a doctrine in the first place. It is a stream of love. It is a stream of salvation would be the technical word for that. So what Jesus brings to my life is not that thinking, is not, not thinking in the first place. It is some action. He brings some action. It is his way of 
doing something for me, within me and with me, that's what makes Christ different from other spiritual leaders. And finally, for this first section, can I truly believe that my religion or faith is the right one and at the same time keep due respect and sincere attention to other systems of belief? Yes, of course. Of course we can. It is deeply built in, as they say. It is deeply rooted in Christian faith that we have due respect for others. And you know why? Because everything has been a gift. What do you have that you haven't received? This is a question that the Apostle St. Paul poses for us. What do you have you haven't received? Everything has been a gift. So even if I am convinced, and dearly, I'm profoundly convinced, I am really convinced that Jesus is my Savior and He is the Savior of everybody that has faith in Him. Even if I am convinced that He is the true and only begotten Son of God the Father, even if I have that kind of conviction, that's not a reason for pride. That's not a reason for excluding others. A true Christian always remembers and frequently is reminded of the fact that everything has been a gift. Everything came to my life as a gift. So what I am doing in attempting to share my faith with others never ever should be imposing imposing my faith to others goes exactly in the opposite direction of what Christian faith is I cannot impose a gift on anybody I cannot God didn't impose his gift of grace on me I am nobody to impose that faith on others. What we do, and hopefully we do it right, is to offer in one of his most powerful encyclicals, Pope John Paul II said that our commitment, our duty as missionaries is not to impose, nor is it to be indifferent. Between that extreme that is imposing my faith and the other extreme that is being indifferent and living alone the rest of the world, between these two extremes, there is the position, the Christian position, which is, I offer my faith. I present it in a very respectful, kind, loving way. So that when God's grace acts upon other minds, other hearts, other lives, they too, they too, might accept what the Lord has for them. So, and this is the conclusion of the first part, to be really convinced and to be completely respectful are not incompatible in Christian faith. All the contrary. I I'm fully convinced, but it is my conviction that everything was a gift for me. 
So I will not impose my gift to anybody else. I only have the duty rooted in love, the duty of sharing with others what I have received, and that is evangelizing. That is the apostolate, that is the work that we are all invited to do as believers. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit,